Okay, this is the uh, first in the series on diabetes. Uh, when we begin, uh, we're going to look at uh, a lot of the baseline information that I'd like you to know. This is just the framework for the diabetic lecture. And let's begin with the pancreas gland. Um, you guys know that the pancreas has two major functions. One is endocrine and one is exocrine. Endocrine means that it's producing hormones and uh, exocrine has to do with digestive uh, function. So with the um, endocrine function of the pancreas gland, it's made up of uh, alpha cells and 25% of the pancreas is made up of alpha cells and these produce and secrete glucagon. And what we'll see in the next slide is that glucagon is used to raise blood sugar levels. 60% uh, of the pancreas gland is made up of beta cells, and these beta cells produce and secrete insulin. And insulin is used to lower the blood sugar levels. And uh, a, a third type of cell that uh, we'll find in the pancreas is the delta cells. And I'm not concerned that you know that much about them right now. Uh, these delta cells, which make up about 10% of the pancreas gland, secrete somatostatin, which is a inhibitory hormone. It helps regulate both the glucagon and insulin levels. Now the exocrine function of the pancreas, like I mentioned before, has to do with uh, producing digestive enzymes like amylase, lipase, that are going to break down uh, proteins and fats. Okay, so the two major hormones that uh, we're going to talk about uh, in this lecture on diabetes, the first one is insulin, and this is the one you really want to focus on. Um, insulin is used by the body to help transport glucose into the cell to be used as energy. And uh, like I mentioned before, insulin will lower the blood sugar levels um, by, by its uh, function. And um, the previous slide, we saw that insulin was produced and secreted by the beta cells. And then the other uh, major hormone that we're going to look at, but not as much as insulin, is glucagon. And what you're going to see is that glucagon is a common hormone that uh, diabetics will carry with them in a little syringe. And often, if they uh, have low blood glucose levels or hypoglycemia, they can inject themselves with glucagon. And what it does is it causes their blood glucose levels to rise. And um, if you remember back in... Um, your physiology course, uh, glucose is stored in the liver as glycogen. And when glucagon is uh, secreted by the body, the glycogen, glycogen breaks down and releases glucose and it raises the blood sugar levels. Okay, now the different types of diabetes that uh, we're gonna look at, the uh, two major ones that we're gonna focus on are type one and type two, but I'm briefly gonna mention uh, the, the second other ones, the uh, secondary and the borderline diabetes also. So in type 1 diabetes, this is uh, what we call juvenile onset. Often this one is seen uh, by the time they reach puberty. Um, and often they would also call this one insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, IDDM. And that means that this person um, does not produce any insulin, therefore, uh, their blood sugars will go sky high and they have to receive insulin injections um, to maintain normal metabolism. So let's look at the uh, characteristics of type 1 over to the right. They're insulin dependent. We mentioned that. It's usually an abrupt onset of signs and symptoms. And we'll find in, the, uh, in a couple slides, it's an autoimmune disorder. What this means is often the, the person has a genetic predisposition to develop diabetes, they're exposed to some type of environmental trigger, usually a viral infection, and what happens is it triggers an autoimmune disorder where the immune system inside the person starts destroying the beta cells within the pancreas. It thinks that those beta cells are foreign cells that attacks them and destroys them, and therefore the person does not produce any insulin and they're insulin dependent. And like I mentioned before, this often occurs uh, before the person reaches puberty. So it's a juvenile onset. Now, the second type of diabetes, this is a very common one. It's non-insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, or some people call it 
adult onset. Usually this happens when the person's around 40 years of age. Um, usually the person is, leads a sedentary lifestyle and often they don't uh, watch what they eat and they, they don't get enough exercise and, and it messes up their, um, their metabolism. So let's look at the characteristics over on this side. Uh, often they're not insulin dependent. So this person still produces insulin, but often this person has what's called insulin resistance. And insulin resistance is where they produce insulin, but the, the uh, insulin they produce or the receptor sites is not sensitive to the insulin they produce. And so therefore their blood sugar levels can go up a little bit high. Um, often this person is regularly obese, uh, generally, this occurs, you know, an adult, you know, usually older than 40 years of age. They have a strong familial pattern, so it runs in the family line, and often this person will lead a sedentary lifestyle. Now, type 2 diabetes, this is one where if the person decides to exercise, uh, check their blood sugar, um, often they can go back to normal metabolism. But... Uh, this one is usually triggered when someone's obese and sedentary, they sit around, they don't uh, change their lifestyle, and they can progress to insulin dependence in uh, late stage type two. Okay, now the other uh, types of diabetes that we're gonna mention here, the other one is called secondary diabetes. This one's associated with diseases or medical treatments that we use in the hospital. Um, for example, um, Let's say someone has pancreatic cancer. That cancer is destroying their pancreas gland and it destroys the beta cells and therefore the person will not produce insulin. And in time, a person with pancreatic cancer will have to check their blood sugar and give them insulin or else their blood sugars will get uh, real high because they don't produce insulin. And um, when we refer to medical treatments, there are certain times when um, someone has a disorder and we may treat them with steroids or TPN and these treatments can cause their blood sugar to go up. Now with steroids, um, once they stop the steroids, you know, their blood sugar will, will go back down to normal. Uh, TPN stands for total parenteral nutrition or hyperalimentation. And this is a type of nutrition that they give the person all the food they need through their IV. And this is when they have uh, different disorders where they cannot eat food uh, properly and it just causes their blood sugars to, to go up. Okay, now let's go on to the, the next one, gestational diabetes. And you guys will learn about this next semester in uh, OB and Peds. Um, it's first recognized during pregnancy, usually in the third trimester. So the woman's pregnant, usually in the third trimester, her blood sugar uh, starts going up. Now this uh, gestational diabetes it can normalize. So after the pregnancy, the woman can go back to normal metabolism. She may remain impaired for the rest of her life, or she later in life may progress to uh, diabetes mellitus. Now, because of the high blood sugar levels inside this person, these women will develop large babies. Now, here's a, a picture of a normal size baby, you know, seven or eight pounds, which is normal. And the one on the right is a large baby, very large baby, a 19 pound uh, baby of a diabetic mother who has gestational diabetes. And what happens is all that blood sugar causes the kid to produce lots of, of fat and they, they get large real, real soon. Often these babies are taken um, by C-section because they're too large to deliver vaginally. And uh, often they take them a few weeks early because they're, they're so large. So let's go on to diabetes incidence. Um, one thing I always joke about students when I'm lecturing in front of the class is that that picture there is not my kids. Uh, they may look like me, uh, but they're not mine. Uh, it, diabetes is a very common endocrine disorder. It affects over 30 million people in the United States. It's the seventh leading cause of death behind heart issues, cancer, respiratory diseases, strokes, accidents, Alzheimer's disease, and then diabetes comes in there. And what we're going to see is that uh, diabetes has a higher incidence in Native Americans, Blacks, Hispanics, and Pacific Islanders. 
Now let's look a little bit at the pathophysiology here of type 1 diabetes. Uh, type 1 diabetes, remember I mentioned a little before, there's a genetic predisposition. And so remember it runs along family lines. Usually before puberty, there's some kind of environmental trigger, often a viral infection, that causes the immune system to uh, attack the beta cells within the, the pancreas. And uh, because the, the beta cells are attacked and destroyed, the person does not produce insulin. And uh, if you don't have insulin, you can't use sugar in your cells. And so the sugar levels build up and they're going to have an osmolarity issue uh, with this ex excess uh, glucose. And all that sugar is going to draw water into the, the blood vessels. And as those blood vessels go through the kidney, the uh, person's going to pee out a lot of the, uh, the fluid. And so they're going to have the, the three polys, polyuria, where they're peeing out their fluids. Because they're peeing a lot, they're going to have polydipsia, which means they drink a lot of fluid, and polyphagia, which means they're hungry because they have uh, muscle wasting. And we'll see that in the next slide. Okay, so to continue the um, pathophysiology of type 1 diabetes, uh, because they have a lack of insulin and glucose is not available for energy, instead of breaking down sugar, they're going to break down fats and proteins like we see right here. Uh, when they break down fats, fats are, uh, form a, um, a byproduct called keto ketones and these are highly acidic and it leads to a ketoacidosis and it can lead to electrolyte imbalances that we'll, we'll learn about later and it can lead to uh, coma and death. Now over here on this side you can see that uh, when the person breaks down proteins for energy they're going to have weight loss and muscle wasting. And because of that, they're going to be hungry because they want to replace the uh, proteins that their body's breaking down. And that can lead to uh, issues. And then back over here on the right side, this is the one we've already talked about. They can't produce insulin, so glucose builds up. They're going to have high levels of glucose in their blood and in their urine. And because of that, they're going to pee out lots and lots of fluids. And so they're going to be thirsty and drink a lot, and they're going to be dehydrated. And those are the common or cardinal signs of uh, diabetes. Okay, now let's look here at uh, the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes. And you can see here that there's two primary defects that are going on here. The first one is insulin resistance. And that means that the body produces insulin but the target cells or the receptor sites are not uh, sensitive to the uh, insulin they produce. And so the blood sugar builds up and they don't use the insulin properly. And what you'll find a lot of times is if the person will go out and exercise and get off the couch and, and uh, leave that sedentary lifestyle, that it makes those receptor sites sensitive. Uh, but like I said, often this person will not change their, their eating habits. They won't change their exercise habits and it leads to an insulin resistance. Now let's go down and look at the, the lower section there, the progressive beta cell decline. Now if you were a beta cell in the uh, pancreas and you're having to produce more and more and more insulin all the time, you're going to wear out in time. And so you're going to see a fatigue that, that will damage the beta cells. You're also going to see that the person has a, because of the hyperglycemia, this leads to what we call glucose toxicity. So the high sugar levels will damage cells. And so this further damages the beta cells. And if you look over here on the right, you can see that they also have what's called lipotoxicity. And this high level of uh, fatty acids and triglycerides also damages the, the cells. And so the beta cells are just getting beat up here by too much sugar, too much fat, and just wear and tear. And so what happens is the beta cells just finally give up and they can't produce the, the insulin that the person needs. Okay, and uh, these are some of the complications of diabetes that, that uh, we're going to see. They're going to have strokes, diabetic retinopathy. It's very common for diabetics to become blind later in life. They'll have atherosclerosis, uh, diabetic neuropathy, impaired immune function, and sexual dysfunction. And um, this, is, this concludes the... Um, the first of the videos
and uh, we'll go to the next video.